and I have no remote, and it's kind of all awkward. So, so tell me if I'm not talking loud enough. I'm, am I not talking loud enough? A little louder. A little bit. Okay, so what I want right now is who here was born in Norway? Put your hand up. Anybody? How many? Were you born in Norway? Anybody? Bunch of families. Anybody have a parent born in Norway? Couple What's, of you? Oh, this good. is not the judge. Anybody have a grandparent born in Norway? Hey. Anybody keep your hands up? Anybody have a great grandparent born in Norway? Hey. Who just came for the potluck? Hey. <laughs> All right. So um, most of us, you know, we have um, we have our, our ancestors came from Norway a few generations ago. So maybe we don't know that much about where they came from, how they got there how they got here, and I don't mean like in a genealogical sense of their names and you know what their dates were, but just how, how their lives were. Why did they decide to come here? What was going on with them? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm focusing on the period of 1825 to 1925, which was when the, the heaviest waves of Norwegians came over here. So, um, sorry. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Viking. Vikings right here. Uh, and that's a little bit before 1825. That's actually about a thousand or so. Leif Erikson was the first uh, Norwegian, he and his people, to get to North America. They didn't come to the United States. They stopped in Newfoundland. And they didn't settle there. They went back to Norway. because they, they got here and they like, eh, we don't like it. We're just going to go back home. Okay. So it took about another uh, 600 years or so before we actually had more Norwegians coming over here. So in about six, the early 1600s, a few dozen Norwegians came over and they settled in New Amsterdam, which is what New York was called back then. Um, so they just they didn't have like a whole group of Norwegians. It was just a few of them mixed in with other people coming from other parts of Europe. Uh, so okay, so there's some Norwegian names and words I'm going to say, and I was going to like ask somebody like Nicole to explain them to me ahead of time, but not I didn't have time, so I'm just going to mispronounce everything. And if somebody wants to correct me, go ahead. Um, so we have. Uh, Hans Hansen Bergen, who was a native of Bergen, Norway, he was one of the earliest settlers in New Amsterdam in 1633. So that's pretty cool that there was a Norwegian over there in early New York with huh. the very, very earliest people that came here joining the, the Native Americans, I imagine. Can I ask? How did they differentiate Norwegians from Swedes back then? <laughs> He was we'll have to hold off questions for the just <laughs> <laughs> That's what? So I, I will tell you, I'm not an expert on any of this. I did a lot of research for this presentation, so I'll try to answer your questions. But I don't really know that much more than what I'm actually going to be telling you. So I, I, I don't know if it was like their hair color or, I don't know. Maybe they just asked. Uh, that would probably be a good one. <laughs> so, um, the next thing we're going to talk about is religious freedom. The earliest uh, immigrants from Norway to come to the United States were coming here for religious reasons for the most part. You know, very similar to, you know, we had the pilgrims come over here. Um, we had Quakers coming over from Norway and also members of a local religious group in Norway called the Hogians. Probably mispronounced it. Haugian. Haugian? Haugian, yeah. okay. They were a reform movement intended to bring new life and vitality to the Norwegian state church by being more pious. Okay? So uh, state church didn't like that, so they, they hooked it over here to the United States uh, from the 1600s. So the first um, kind of big ship organized just by Norwegians to come over here uh, was the Restoration. Um, it came in 1825, so this is a whole other 200 years or so. It was a group of six families. This is a painting because they didn't actually have cameras back then. But you can see it's not that big a boat. Uh, it is 54 feet in length and 16 in width. And how much is 16? That's like, uh, it's like about this wide, wow. right? Do you think? So, yeah, so that's not big. Can you imagine being on a boat 16 feet wide and going all the way across the ocean when like nobody does that? Do you know how big people were on the ship? There were 52 people on there when they left. When they got to the United States, there were 53 because there was a baby born on the ship. <laughs> you know, nobody died on that one. Um, people did die on a lot of the ships, but that one they were pretty lucky. Um, a lot of the ships coming over had babies being born because it was a long trip. It was, uh, I think, about 14 weeks or so on a ship. That's a pretty long 
14 weeks? 14 weeks to get across the ocean, because it's a sailboat. I mean, look at that thing. It's a fucking no have enough food to feed them for that long. Well, you, you, have, you have barrels of salt pork. Salt or and flat pork. preserved. Like bread. Flat bread, yeah. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't interrupt. Well, so I, I didn't put this in my presentation, but there's actually a story. They stopped in Portugal on the way and had some miscommunication and didn't get enough water, and they ran out before they got to the United States. So it was almost a tragedy. But oh. They just made it in time. So. Portugal is south, not east and west. Right, but the wind, the wind for coming from Europe is best down south, and so they would go down south and catch the trade winds across to the Caribbean, like Charleston was often the first port of call, then come up the east coast and then go back from the north across to England. So this is our uh, ship path sailing expert, if there's any further questions. This <laughs> 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 Uncle Torvald told me. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah. This was in 1825, um, and the ship the ship was built in 1801 to transport herring and grain, and it wasn't built as a ship to go across the ocean. So they were kind of really taking a big risk there, this clunky old ship going all the way across the ocean. That's kind of scary. The ship is uh, so, yeah, I'm sure they did. And so when they got to New York, the local press marveled at their bravery because you know, I mean, they, they were pretty brave going on that ship. They were Norwegian brave pilgrims. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Uh, so this is a replica of their restoration. Um, this was when it was in progress in 2007. They finished it in 2010, um, and it's in the harbor at Stavanger. So Stavanger, Stavanger. Stavanger, okay. I've got like three more times, so I'll probably do it wrong again. So uh, right here we have a map, and I will show you about where some of the early Norwegian settlers went. Um, huh. the, the, the settlers from the Restoration, so they landed in New York right over here. They went actually up here to Kendall, New York. It's by Rochester. Um, the local Quakers helped them out, you know, kind of gave them a place to live, got them, you know, set up for everything. Um, this isn't necessarily their route. I did it on Google Maps. I kind of went along the road. I don't know where they actually went, and then I, I don't know how they went. Probably Oxford, I think that's better. <coughs> so they went to uh, Kendall and settled there, but after a while, after a while, uh, several members of the group, or six families actually, went all the way over here to um, the Fox River settlement south of Chicago. Uh, they purchased land there. It was 125 an acre. What was the it's question? The first permanent Norwegian settlement in okay. I visited here later. Okay. Uh, when so they settled there, they called it the Fox River Settlement, though. Yeah, they later changed the name to Oh, okay. So um, from there, some of them later moved on to Illinois and Wisconsin as well. So the next ships were the Den Norski Clippy and the Norden, and I know that's wrong. Uh, they went in 1836 from Stavanger. Um, Good. Yeah, most of them went up to the Fox River Settlement as well. Starting about eight, uh, 1836 or so, there were ships coming from Norway pretty much every year. So that was, you know, there's lots of opportunities if you wanted to go. Am I still talking loud enough? Mm -hmm. Let me yeah. wave your hands if I'm You're not. fine. So this is the, um, shows a population of Norway. And this is a big part of the reason why people were leaving Norway, is they had a big, uh, uh, a population explosion starting in about 1815, the population grew at a really rapid rate, and that was partially because the mortality rate dropped. So a lot more children grew up to be adults than had previously. From 1810 to 1865, the population of Norway nearly doubled. So with all that, you just weren't enough jobs to go around. A lot of people are farmers, they're not enough farmland. If you're a younger son of a landowner, it's the older son that's going to get the farm, so there's really not much for you if there's no new land to go to. So these are the people that were like, we need to go somewhere else because, you know, there's nothing here for us. Um, and basically there wasn't enough of the industry in Norway to keep everybody above the minimum subsistence level. I'm always from a terrible <laughs> So um, the Homestead Act is another thing that, that happened that got people coming to the United States from Norway. 
And what this was is anybody in the United States, you didn't have to be a citizen first, you got 160 acres of land for free. That's a great price. I would like that. Um, the Homestead Act, uh, the first law was passed in 1862, and there were modifications after that. So there's three steps you had to take to get a homestead. The first thing, file an application. Second thing, you approve your land, and then you file for the deed and you're the owner. So to start out to file an application, all you have to be is 21 or older, or head of a family, and also have never taken up arms against the U.S. government. So that's pretty much everybody. So in five years, you have to live on the land for five years. That's the requirement, and you have to improve it, like building buildings or making a farm out of it. After five years, if you can prove that you improved the land, that you actually lived on it for five years, you get the deed, and that was your land for free. So that's like a really great opportunity that they weren't getting in Norway and anywhere else. Well, we were just talking about that, saying that, and I had thought it was seven, because I had people in my family that home state that settled in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, in 1910, and they didn't stay there that long, and I think there wasn't enough land to make enough food to make enough to live on. Right, and she well, said, she said that they, they changed the law, you know, they modified it over the years sometimes. I think at one time the age dropped to 16. Mm -hmm. Some land you had to irrigate it, it would, you know, bury it. Yeah, I just, they, they didn't make the time on it. They weren't able to. Right. Now to please your question. I can't hear you. Repeat the question. She said they still have their homestead in South Dakota. There was a what you would do, you know, if you had a son who, especially like a big teenage boy, they would write 21 on the bottom of his shoes, and then he would swear, I'm over the age of 21. <laughs> so then he could get 160 acres, too, and that's how you get a farm, is you get several of your family all. Okay. Or you, you take the 160 acres that has the spring, and then if anybody takes the other stuff, they won't be able to make a living on it, but it'll be all right that you can do it. I am glad I was not your neighbor. Or <laughs> Uncle What is this? Well, you know, if somebody would keep interrupting me from the back, I would <laughs> Yeah, let's I'm try not, not to. About this. Uh, what this is, is a book that came out in 1838, I believe, by Holy Rinning. Uh, it's called A True Account of America for the Information and Help of Peasant and Commoner. What a name for a book. Hmm. Um, so basically what was happening, once Norwegians got here in the United States, they were all writing letters home, telling everybody to come over here, their families, their neighbors, you know, and a few people started publishing books, and this guy wrote this book that was really popular, because it wasn't just, you know, a lot of the other books were just, oh, this is what the United States is like, but this guy wrote a book, it was actually a question and answer dialogue to address the fears of the prospective immigrant. So, like, how do you get your land, how do you do this, you know, all sorts of things. Like, like they have frequently asked questions now, it's kind of pretty much a how to book. Yeah, a how to book. So it was something really unusual, and it was very popular, and this book can be credited for getting a lot of Norwegians coming over here uh, between the 1830s and 1860s. So the next thing we have here is Norwegian immigrant arrivals by year, and we're starting out in 1836, which is about when I told you uh, his book came out going to 1900 over there. So between 1825 and 1925, um, which is a little longer than this chart, 800,000 Norwegians came to the North America. That's that's a whole lot of Norwegians. That was about a third of Norway's population. No country other than Ireland. Ireland had more larger percentage, but Norway was second in the percentage of their whole population that just got up and left and came to North America. You know, and, and you saw from the other chart, Norway's population kept increasing over that time. So it's not, there are, their population is already increasing because of the kind of baby boom thing. So losing all those people didn't make the country smaller, it just grew less fast. But that's a whole lot of people that come over here. Um, so there's two big bumps you can see right here where, where the, the numbers get higher. The first one yeah. is 1865. What that was was the end of the Civil, Civil War. War. Obviously nobody's coming over during the Civil War, but once it was over, you know, the country was ready to go and take new people in. So there was a, a, a big wave of immigration right there. Um, about eight years, 100,000 people came over. And the next one was in 1880 to 1893, and that's that second big bump wow. you see right there. 
Uh, what that was, what was happening then is travel got a lot easier, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but, you know, I, I was talking about earlier how they're going across land in an ox cart, and all they had this ship that was tiny and sailing, and it got easier. Once it got easier, even more people came over here. Um, there's also something different that happened about the same time. Before 1880, pretty much it was families coming over here, and because the trip was so hard and long, and they didn't know what was going to happen. When they came over here, they came over here to stay. They didn't intend to ever go back. This was their family and they were staying. They were going to be in the United States and this was their thing. After 1880, we had kind of different immigrants. When they were younger, uh, educated people moving without their families. Like young people, you know, just just out of, I guess, well, they didn't really have college. I was going to say just out of college. But, you know, just grown up out into the world and they get on a ship and come over here by themselves. So that was kind of a really different thing and it increased the number of people coming over as well. The peak of immigration per, per, per year was 28,804 people came over in 1882, which is the whole pointy part up there. That's a lot of people. So uh, I said North America earlier. They didn't all come to the United States. Some of them actually came to Canada. Most of the United States, but there were Norwegians going to Canada too. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about who was coming over here. They were mostly farmers. This is a farming Norway. Um, they were mostly from the inner fjord districts of western Norway and the central mountain districts. Um, there were people maybe that owned, owned land and they sold their land to finance their trip. Or that some of them were younger sons of independent farmers who were going to inherit land because they were younger sons, as they mentioned earlier. Um, so in the 1850s and towards the 1880s is when more people started coming, like not people that, that owned land, but farmers for hire and lower classes in rural society, you know, because travel got cheaper and then it was easier for, you know, people to come over and didn't have to have as much money. So what you can see here, this is Bergen, Norway in the 1860s. There are a little port here. Um, so the most important ports in Norway, as far as people living from, were Christiana, which is what Oslo was called, Bergen and Stavanger. Stavanger. Yeah, Stavanger. Say it again? Stavanger. 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 Okay, close enough. So, <laughs> so the voyage was long. You know, I, I told you it was 14 weeks for the restoration ship. Right now it's about two months or more, which is eight weeks. You know, it's a little bit shorter. The ships are getting better. Depends on weather and wind. But still a really strenuous trip. It's unsanitary conditions, illness. A lot of people died. It wasn't, it wasn't a fun thing. Um, so later in the 1880s, uh, you know, kind of changed the way the shipping patterns went. Instead of taking ships directly from Norway, immigrants would take a ship from Norway to the east coast of England, then they go overland to Liverpool and the west coast, um. then they took a transatlantic ship to the United States. So instead of going directly from Norway, they went through Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> Sneaky. So this is nice. This is the Erie, the Beatles were not actually alive. Uh, this is, and they're not Norwegian, I don't think. The Erie Canal is what this is. It was completed in 1825, and this is a really important thing to immigrants. Um, it's a 363 mile long waterway connecting Albany to Buffalo. Uh, before that, you know, I said the ox carts, I mentioned those a couple times. It's really hard to get anywhere. What this was is they'd start in New York, you could go up the Hudson River to Albany. Get on the Erie Canal, you go from Albany to Buffalo, and then you're at the Great Lakes and you can go anywhere in a ship. So the whole journey was in a boat through the United States instead of on the land. It's a lot easier. Um, so once they're in the Great Lakes, they could get to cities like Chicago or Milwaukee, which were kind of like the stepping off points to getting to the rest of the Midwest. But this time, almost all the immigrants were coming via New York. Um, the canal, once it was open, it cut the travel time in the Midwest by almost 70% and transportation costs by 90%. So that's pretty incredible. You know, that's why a lot of people before were staying maybe in New York and Pennsylvania, and now they can go west. It's so much easier to do that. So then something happened in 1949, and what that was, uh, a repeal of the British Navigation Act permitted Norwegian ships to transport people directly from Norway back and take lumber back to Great Britain. Um, so basically Canada was part of Great Britain then. For a while when the, the navigation acts were in place, the ships couldn't go that way. But now that they could, this was a really profitable route for the ships to go to Quebec and
and be able to take one from her back to Britain. So that's what all the ships started doing. So from 1849. So from 1849, uh, between 1850 and 1865, most Norwegian immigrants went on their ships. They went to Quebec, not New York during that period, um, because of the, the shipping things. So that's kind of interesting. That's the, I learned a lot when I was putting this together. That's something I, I didn't know, that yeah. Norwegians were going to Quebec. That's pretty cool. So once they're in Quebec, uh, they took a Great Lake ship. From, um, they could go through Lake Michigan, get again to Milwaukee or Chicago. They still have a little ox cart going on there to get to southern Wisconsin, but it's not too bad. Uh, the picture, this is Port of Quebec in the 1920s or 1930s. So a little bit later, it was hard to find uh, pictures for the right time periods, but kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. Huh. Yeah, but the thing is, you hear about Ellis Island, you think everybody 
everybody went there, but turns out only the poor people went there. The rich people, if you're traveling first or second class on the ship, the doctor came on board, examined you, the immigration officer, and then you just got off the ship, you were done. It was other people, us poor people, we were in a third class, what's called steerage, which is when you're below the water line, you don't have a porthole to look out. You're in big dormitories, there's no windows, little ventilation or lighting. Maybe it's not that much better than the sailing ships, maybe a little bit, but you know, hopefully you had money and didn't have to go on steerage. But if you didn't have the money, this is where you uh, went in Ellis Island, a, a facility for processing everybody. You might have heard about this, it was not a pleasant experience. You had to go through a medical examination, they had like look and see if you had red eye and all these different things and see if you had TB. Um, if you had a contagious disease like that, they were sending you back, they didn't want you. Um, what they did is when the doctor examined you, if he thought you had a contagious disease, you know, and they were pretty much guessing a lot of the time, but if he thought you were contagious, he would have chalk and he would mark on your clothing what, what was wrong with you. So they would know not to process you through the next point in line or whatever. But smart people would wipe the chalk marks off or turn their clothes inside out or do something so they get to the next point and, and you know. If you, you know, if you, if you traveled out that way, you're going to find a way to, to stay. You're not, you're not getting sent back. Um, so they, the, they went to an inspector next, and the inspector only had two minutes about for each person to decide if they should stay in the United States. He asked them 29 questions, including name, occupation, and they think how much money they had with them. Because we didn't want people here if they didn't have enough money to support themselves. They had to have about $18 to $25 on them to come to the United States. Doesn't seem like a lot now, but that was a lot of money back then. So most immigrants got through. There's only 2% that got turned back and had to go back to their country. You know, it was hard for them. I mean, that would be horrible to come all this way on a ship and have to go back, but it was only 2%. So what's interesting, the very last person to pass through Ellis Island was a Norwegian. In 1954, a merchant seaman by the name of Arne Peterson was the very last person in Ellis Island before they closed it. So I think that's kind of special. Oh, now it's a museum. Now it's a museum, mm -hmm. yes. Very interesting to go through it, too. Have you you've been in it? Yes. Okay, so you will be giving a presentation oh, the no, next no. time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is the United States, if you've never seen it before. Um, so as I said, the earliest settlements are over here, Pennsylvania, and some people made it to Illinois. Um, in the 1840s to 1850s, Wisconsin was the place to go. That's where most of the Norwegian immigrants ended up. Um, and it remained so until about the Civil War. Um, about that time, Norwegians started moving further west into Iowa and Minnesota. Um, what's interesting, in, in 1870, um, in Minnesota, the Scandinavians had overtaken the Germans to be the largest ethnic group in Minnesota. So that's kind of neat, because we like beating out other people. Um, so then around the 1870s, they kept moving further west, Norwegian settlements in the Dakotas there. By 1910, 80% of Norwegian Americans lived in the upper Midwest. There's still some out east that had made it further, but 80% were further in these two states right there. Um, they did go a little bit further. There's actually big settlements uh, that ended up in Washington State or in Seattle, also in Oregon. The Mormons kind of recruited some people and took them to Utah. Um, on the West Coast, it was actually good for Norwegians because there's a lot of fishing and, and lumber and that sort of thing there, which was things they're used to at home. There's then smaller settlements in Brooklyn, Alaska, and Texas, and you know I'm sure Norwegians kind of went out all, all over and they maybe didn't have a settlement, but now Norwegians are just everywhere. So uh, this is a farm, mm -hmm. and Norwegians in America were deeply attached to farming. They were of all the immigrant groups coming over here, they were the most rural. Um, in 1900. About half of Norwegian born people here were the breadwinners for their family, were either farm owners or farm workers. Um, farming in the United States was different.